Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We, uh, as Liz said, are here to talk about special needs planning, and we thought this was a timely topic given that October is special needs planning month. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, I am going to be touching on several topics, including special needs or supplemental needs trusts um, that come into play when you are a person on any government benefits or deemed disabled yourself, or if you have a loved one, a beneficiary that you would like to leave assets to who falls into that category. And so we'll be going through a few different things that come up um, as we're doing planning for these individuals and uh, talk about how to best handle those situations. So first of all, when we speak about special needs planning and when we're talking about the planning that goes into it, what we're talking about is creating a plan that maximizes the inheritance left to the individual who has special needs or who is disabled, while also maximizing the government benefits for which they may be entitled. And so it's really about the maximization of those benefits. And as we know, when we talk about somebody being disabled, and, and we often put that in quotes, because what we're talking about is someone who falls into a category that qualifies for these government benefits, either because they have been deemed disabled by the Social Security Administration, that's the federal government, or deemed disabled by the state of New York for the purpose of government benefits. We could also be talking about someone who is on SSI, Supplemental Security Income, who has to have less than a certain level of assets. And if they do have less than those level of assets and the assets are in a special type of trust, they can still receive some government benefits. Now, when we talk about uh, someone who is disabled, we might be talking about somebody with a cognitive disability. So this is someone who um, has perhaps a developmental disability, something that happened at birth, um, something that makes it difficult for them to handle their own affairs. And then for others, we may just be referring to a physical disability. So they still receive these government benefits, but they're actually able to handle many things on their own because cognitively in their brain, they have no issue handling their affairs, but if there's a physical issue that requires some additional care and additional assistance from the government. And so every time that we're talking about any of these things, really in the end, you need to have specialized advice and specialized plans for the type of disability and the type of government benefits that the individual is receiving. Um, that also goes along with the disclaimer that I often put on these webinars, which is that none of this is meant to be legal advice. And really what we're doing here today is educating um, you about what are the types of things and considerations available when you have a special needs person as a beneficiary and how to properly plan for that individual. So what is a supplemental needs trust? So a supplemental needs trust, a special needs trust, these are types of trusts that are for the benefit of an individual who is on government benefits, who wants to keep those government benefits and the assets being in the trust allow them to gain extra assistance through certain programming. So when we are looking at what the Supplemental Needs Trust does, it supplements, not supplants, government benefits. So it is meant to enhance the life of the disabled beneficiary and allow them to have the benefit of what the government can offer them. We might be talking about health benefits, um, health insurance benefits, Medicare, Medicaid benefits, SSI, which I talked about, is uh, actually income that comes in for people who do not have income and who have assets uh, under a certain limit. We might be talking about housing benefits, SNAP benefits, which used to be known as food stamps, and certain programming. Uh, we've had individuals where we need to protect the SSI benefits not because the SSI benefits and the health insurance that comes along with it is necessary uh, monetarily. You know, in New York, you're talking about between eight and nine hundred dollars a month that you can receive in SSI. And sometimes there could be millions, if not more, in one of these trusts. So sometimes it's not about the money. Sometimes it's about the government programs or the educational programming that comes along with it. Um, we had a, an individual uh, who was 
the beneficiary of a very large trust that was left to them from family members. And it, they didn't need any money, but they needed access to certain programming and educational uh, events. And they could receive the access to those educational events by having the SSI and the Medicare. And so without that government benefit, they couldn't get those programs. So it's an important um, thing to look at what are you looking to gain from the program from the benefits and does it make sense to have a trust to protect the assets? There's also a reason to have the trust, which is that for especially those beneficiaries who have a cognitive inability to handle their own affairs, you're creating a situation where assets can be left to them but and be used for their benefit, but they don't have to manage it themselves. Some clients come in and say, well, I'm not going to leave everything to my one child because they have a disability, so I'm going to leave everything to the other child. Um, and that can be very difficult because you're creating a situation where First of all, the child that you're leaving everything to, uh, they may have a spouse or children of their own. And if they pass away before your disabled child, that money may go according to their plan, to their children, to their spouse, not to your other child. Um, and there's no ability to separate out what are the assets for my one child and what are the assets for the other. And so a supplemental needs trust is usually a better way to do that, to divide your estate the way that you want to between your children. There's multiple types of trust that we could be talking about. So we call them first party, third party, and sole benefit. They're also pooled trusts. So those are four types of trust. The first party trust is a, is a trust that is funded with the money of the disabled individual. So if I am given $100,000, and it comes to me and then, or I've earned it and then I become disabled or I've been disabled and I receive this money and I want to continue receiving my government benefits, I can create a trust and I can put my $100,000 that I received into that trust. Someone else will be the beneficiary and then that money can be used as I need it, but not take away my government benefits. That first party trust is a necessary asset for people who do have money in their name or who were left money, but not properly in a trust. Uh, but the downside to it is that there is a payback to the Medicaid program at the death of the beneficiary. And so many times people don't want a first party trust and they want to try and do proper planning to avoid that type of trust having to be created to further protect the benefits beyond the life of the disabled beneficiary. Take my example of if you have two children, if you leave the assets to one child in a first and they get it in their name and then they have to put it into a first party trust, if they die before their sibling upon their death, there's this payback. Whereas if it is properly planned for an advance and you don't use the first party trust, that money could then be passed on to your other child at the death of the first child. That then leads us to third party trusts. This is the hope. We want to create third party trusts. So if I have a disabled beneficiary and my documents say that upon my death, a certain amount of money or a certain percentage of my estate goes into a supplemental needs trust for the benefit of my beneficiary who is disabled and has all the necessary language to make it a proper trust for these purposes, then that is a third party trust. And the benefit there is that that payback is not in it. So if I leave everything in a supplemental needs trust to my disabled child, I can then say in that trust where those assets go when my disabled child passes away, and it does not include a payback to the state Medicaid program. And so a third party trust is the gold standard. It's what we want to create if we have the ability to do it. And it all really comes down to where did the money come from? If it's the disabled beneficiary's money, it has to go into a first party trust. But if it's being left for them, it could be left for them in a third party trust. And then the sole benefit trust. So a sole benefit trust are at when assets are left to the disabled beneficiary in a trust and there's a payback at the death. But the difference is if you take, for example, I had a woman, she had about $200,000 in her name 
and uh, she needed a nursing home and she wanted Medicaid to pay for her nursing home care. She had a disabled daughter. So we were able to take the $200,000, put it into a sole benefit trust for the sole benefit of her disabled child. And the disabled child would have the use of that money for her lifetime. But then upon the death of the disabled child, there was a payback. And so it is a trust that basically says, okay, mom, we're going to let you make these transfers to a trust for your daughter. And she's going to have that money for her lifetime because she's probably going to need it. But then we're going to ask you for a payback. And so that's a sole benefit trust. The last trust I mentioned is a pooled trust. A pooled trust is actually a type of first party trust. So that is a trust that takes the assets of the disabled beneficiary, and then it can be used for their benefit. Pooled trusts are run and administered by charities. There's various charities throughout the state that do this. They take an administrative fee to do so, and then they either manage the assets or just use the assets to pay your bills. This is the most common trust used for an individual who is over 65 years old, who is receiving Medicaid home care services for their excess income. We put their excess income into a pooled income trust run by a charity, and then that money can be used for the benefit of that individual. We can also take assets uh, if we have a younger person who let's say uh, got a $15,000 gift and they don't know what to do with it. Um, there's a few options for what to do with it, but one of them is we can put it in a pooled trust, which saves the expense of creating a freestanding trust um, for the individual because it's set for a smaller amount of money. And then the pooled trust assets can be used for the individual. Upon the individual's death, there is a that money that has accumulated or is left in that trust does not go to the family members or the or any intended beneficiaries. It goes to the charity that runs the trust. So you want to make sure that you're not overfunding a pooled trust with money that you would anticipate to be going elsewhere. Um, the Next type of trust I want to talk about, the next type of supplemental needs trust is the distinction between a testamentary trust and a living trust. So if I have a last will and testament, and I say in my last will and testament that my assets are left in a supplemental needs trust for my beneficiary, then upon my death, if I have assets in my sole name with no beneficiary listed on the asset, my will will go through the process of probate. Upon that probate process finishing, the trustee will be appointed in the supplemental needs trust under my will and will get letters of trusteeship from the court that allow them to go and open up a bank account in the name of the supplemental needs trust. And then the executor can pay the bequest or the assets over to that trustee to manage for the benefit of the, bene of the disabled person. We like to avoid trust being created through a will as a testamentary trust for a few reasons. One is there's often um, the delay in the probate process. So if we have a beneficiary who's going to need assets relatively quickly, we could be talking six months or more, you never know, for probate. And that could be a really big problem. What does the beneficiary do in the meantime? An additional delay is created often when there's a disabled beneficiary because the court can appoint what's called a guardian ad litem, a GAL, to represent the interests of the disabled person in the probate proceeding. This person needs to be appointed, they need to do an investigation, uh, report to the court, and all that has to happen before the will can be probated and the trust can be created. And so again, that can be additional delay. And the, the amount of that delay will vary on the situation, uh, what else is going on in that probate proceeding, and also on what county you're in. And so you really want to, again, look for that local advice to see, are you going to be delaying the estate in a way that is going to be detrimental either to the estate or to the disabled beneficiary or to the other beneficiaries by going through probate. The other issue with having a testamentary trust, again, a trust created through your last will and testament, is that there's continued court involvement and oversight. So let's say that one child is designated the trustee of the supplemental needs trust for your disabled child. 
But as time goes on, your child who is the trustee is no longer able to act as trustee. They have their own health issues, whatever happens. And now we need to have a successor trustee appointed, perhaps a niece or a nephew or someone else. Well, there needs to be a petition to the court for a successor trustee to be appointed. So every time something has to change in the life of the trust, you have to go back to the court that did the probate and created the trust and ask for that relief. And again, that's just more delay and more, more uh, expense to the trust. So what we would rather do is have what I would call a freestanding trust. We want a trust that exists outside of your last will and testament and a trust that does so it doesn't fall under the probate process and it doesn't have that continued issue with the court. So there's a few different ways you can do that. Um, if we have a, a family that comes in and they tell us they have a disabled beneficiary, one of the questions I would ask is, do you have multiple donors. So are there multiple people that are looking to leave assets to this disabled beneficiary? If there are, then we probably want to create a freestanding trust, as I call it, a freestanding supplemental needs trust or special needs trust, where the assets can go into that trust from anybody who leaves it. So if there's grandparents on both sides who want to leave a bequest to that child, it can all funnel into one freestanding trust that has one bank account where the assets can be managed rather than everybody's will or everybody's trust creating its own trust, because that can just be really complicated and difficult, especially once we get into tax reporting requirements um, and other management issues of the trusts. So creating that freestanding trust when there is an anticipation that there, there will be multiple people leaving money behind to the disabled beneficiary can be really important. You can also create in your own estate plan a revocable living trust or an irrevocable living trust. And either can say that upon your death, the assets are left in a trust to your disabled beneficiary. And that disabled beneficiary doesn't have the guardian ad litem with the court, doesn't have to deal with probate because this was all done in a living trust that you created during your lifetime. And so that is a better way also to do it to avoid those delays and costs that I referred to. So what can the supplemental needs trust pay for, the special needs trust pay for? Well, part of it is determined by what government benefits the individual is receiving. And part of it is determined by the rules of the trust. But generally speaking, always remember that a trust can supplement but not supplant government benefits. So if you have SSI, which is intended to pay for food and shelter, then you should not have the trust give for food or shelter. And if you do, there'll be a reduction in the SSI benefits. Same with SNAP, food stamps. If, the, if those are the benefits that are being received and you give money or pay for food from the trust for the beneficiary, there'll be a loss in those benefits. If it's um, Medicaid and it's paying for certain home care or health care, you can't double pay for the same services. But if you receive eight hours a day, for example, of Medicaid funded home care and Medicaid won't pay for more than eight hours a day, you can use the trust to pay for additional hours above and beyond what Medicaid will cover. Med uh, the trust can pay for alternative treatments uh, sometimes that's massage, it's Reiki, it's uh, acupuncture, certain uh, things that if you can't get them covered by insurance, the trust can pay for. It can pay for certain equipment. Um, we have some who say, you know, I found this special motorized wheelchair that I think is really going to benefit me or is really going to benefit my loved one and I want to buy it, but it's not covered under our health insurance. Well, the trust can be used to purchase that modifications to the home in order to make it accessible to a car, to a van, whatever it is that's needed for the individual that the government benefits aren't paying for, the trust can pay for. The trust can't give cash. So I love the movie example, right? So if I go to see a movie and I'm a disabled beneficiary and I have a trust like this, the trustee can't give me $20 or $40 uh, 
you know, if I want to go see a movie and, and get some stuff. Now, what if I want to have popcorn at the movie? So I, I already can't get cash to pay for the movie, but let's say I have a, a, a special card. You can get a special debit card that's attached to the trust that allows me as the beneficiary to have a little control, but my trustee can still be watching what I'm doing and make sure I'm not breaking the rules. Okay, so I paid for my, for my ticket, but what if I want popcorn? Well, you're not supposed to be using trust assets for food or shelter. So is popcorn at the movies food? It is. And there's certain disregards each month for what can be spent on uh, food. But certainly that's something that as the trustee of the trust, you have to make sure you're managing. Again, not because it's really about that small amount of money, but because if you break the rules, you could be jeopardizing the government benefits, which might be paying for and providing a lot of services. You can also pay for a companion. So if I want to travel um, and go on a trip and I have a companion that I need to come with me because I can't go alone, then there can be provisions where the trust pays for the companion as well. Now, if I want two companions, well, now that might be an issue because unless I have a medical need for two companions, that might not be covered. I want to talk next about tax reporting requirements for the trust. So because of the type of trust it is, you want to make sure that if you're the trustee of a, a, a special needs trust or a supplemental needs trust, that you are seeking the advice of an accountant that's knowledgeable in this area. There are certain tax benefits and certain deductions that are given for income taxes on trusts that are called qualified disability trusts, if they're drafted properly and the assets are used properly to fall into that exception. So you want to be speaking not just with an attorney to draft these documents, but also with an accountant to make sure that you're properly complying with the IRS code to get those special deductions. You will be able to, to the extent that income is generated by trust assets, let's say there's an investment account in the trust, if it stays in the trust, the trust pays the tax on that income in a given year. However, to the extent that income is paid out to the beneficiary, the beneficiary will file to pay those income taxes. In many cases, it is more beneficial to have the income pass out to the beneficiary if we can, if we can use the assets in the trust, the income in the trust to pay for things for the beneficiary, we're often in a better spot because trusts automatically are gonna go to the highest tax bracket very quickly, whereas the individual who's disabled, especially if they're unable to work, are gonna be in a much lower tax bracket. And so it could mean a tax benefit when the income is able to be paid out to the beneficiary. Again, not as cash, but to pay for goods and services. We call it in-kind. So it can pay for um, whatever the item is that needs to be purchased rather than give money to the beneficiary to buy the item. That's supplemental needs trusts and special needs trusts. Now, I want to touch on guardianship issues. Um, I'm only going to touch on this briefly, but when you have a disabled beneficiary, the question becomes when they turn 18, what's going to happen? Are they able to make decisions on their own? Can they make healthcare decisions? Can they make money management decisions? Again, if we have somebody with a developmental disability or a cognitive disability where that's difficult for them, you might have to get authority, even as the parent, to make those decisions. Because remember, once they turn 18, they are an adult. That individual is an adult. And just like you would have to give authority for somebody to handle your affairs, so does the disabled beneficiary. And so we often start with the inquiry of, is that disabled beneficiary disabled in a way where they have the capacity to sign documents giving this authority? Or uh, are they, are they, have they totally lost that capacity? So if they can sign documents, well, then they can identify who should be power of attorney for them, who should be healthcare agent, and they can sign that document and give that authority. But if the individual cannot do so because they don't have the mental capacity to do so, well, then they can have a guardian appointed. 
In New York, we call it a guardian of the property, guardian of the person. It is different than, it's the same as the, the terminology, which is different out, out of state. Many states use the term conservator, but we use the term guardian. And for the guardian, uh, there's two types of guardianship. One is through the surrogate's court. It's called a 17A guardian, and that is for developmental disabilities. And there's very strict guidelines on that. And there's a, it's called what we would refer to as a plenary guardianship. So there aren't individualized powers. It's just when the guardian has the power to handle everything for the individual. As opposed to a mental hygiene law article 81 guardian, where it's more of a, we call it the least restrictive alternative, and it's a picking and choosing so that the guardian can be appointed to handle certain functions for the individual, but not handle others that the individual can either handle on their own, or there's another uh, area that's set up, somebody else who's set up to help them in that area. And so exactly which type of guardianship might be appropriate, again, is something that should be discussed with an attorney in the specific circumstances. Another topic I want to refer to is uh, the SECURE Act. So the SECURE Act um, is the, the act that was put into place. It was signed in December of 2019 and was effective January 1 of 2020. So for individuals who died after January 1 of 2020 and died with tax deferred retirement accounts, it changed the way that their beneficiaries could inherit those accounts. It did other things as well, but for the purpose of this conversation, the big change was that as a beneficiary of one of those retirement plans, I could no longer take a stretch over my life expectancy. So if my mother died and had there was $150,000 in an IRA and I was named as the beneficiary, then when I inherited that, I would only have to take a very small distribution every year based on my life expectancy. It would be small because I was younger than the person who left it to me. So I had a much longer life expectancy. I take it out over my lifetime and it continues to grow tax deferred. Now with the SECURE Act, there's a requirement that beneficiaries take the entire account by the 10th year after the death. So that means that I have to take all of that account out, which means I have to pay the income taxes on those withdrawals each year. That could be for a very large retirement account, that could be a lot of taxes. One of the great things that the SECURE Act did, as hard as it is for those other beneficiaries, for those that turn, fall into certain groups and those who are disabled or chronically ill fall into this category, there's an exception to the 10-year payout you can still get a life expectancy payout if you're disabled or chronically ill. And to take that a step further, you can also get the lifetime payout on a trust that has the proper language that allows for a disabled beneficiary to, to receive that over their own life expectancy, but the assets go into the trust where they remain protected. So if you do have extensive retirement accounts uh, or, or any retirement accounts, you should be speaking with your estate planning and your special needs planning attorney about how to properly leave behind those assets and which assets to leave to your disabled beneficiaries and which assets to leave to your other beneficiaries. Because with all the exceptions to the new rule, you might want to change the allocations of who gets what. And there might be a way that you can equal out the gifts but just do so in the most tax efficient manner. The last thing that I want to discuss is called an ABLE account. An ABLE account is an account where the disabled person can have access to the account on their own. It's an account with the bank. They can have a debit card on the account and it can have up to $500,000 in it. That limit was raised um, uh, by legislation. Uh, but it's important to note that only 15,000 per year can go into that account. So if there's a grandmother on each side, they can't both give the $15,000 annual exclusion amount to the trust each year. They've got to take turns. You can't have multiple ABLE accounts. Um, so you want to make sure that you're properly planning with the ABLE account, but it's a nice way to give the beneficiary access to funds without getting in the way of government benefits. And so a lot of people like the ABLE account as a supplement to 
the supplemental needs trust. You could even have a supplemental needs trust give money to the ABLE account, again, because the ABLE account can allow the individual more access to cash, whereas the trust cannot. Um, I'm going to stop now and see if there's any questions. Um, so please, as Liz said, there's a Q&A section, so you can write into the, the Q&A uh, section, and um, we'll see if we can answer your questions. Uh, just one moment, I'm going to read the one in front of me. So there's a question about um, someone who has some, um, some mental illness uh, issues and they are currently on Medicaid services and there's a disagreement in the family as to whether or not that person will need care down the line. Um, I would say that any assets left in that individual to that individual should be left in a trust with someone other than this beneficiary as the trustee. Um, and you can do it two ways. You can either leave the assets to that individual in a trust um, that is labeled as a supplemental needs trust, or what we often do is we create a trust, but we put in our documents that if any beneficiary of ours is on government benefits at the time of your death, that that person's share triggers into a supplemental needs trust. So if they're not on government benefits where it has to be a supplemental needs trust, then it can be a different type of trust, what we would call a general needs trust that allows for someone else to manage the assets, but give your beneficiary what they need. And then again, if it needs to trigger into a supplemental needs trust, it can. Um, if that individual has a follow-up question to the one they wrote, feel free to type it in. Um, Okay. So there's a question about um, someone who's already written the will and do they need to, um, they didn't, the child beneficiary did not have uh, the special needs trust at the time and now does. And so is there anything that needs to be changed? What I would say is that you should certainly call the office and we should schedule a time to speak. And if you are in this circumstance and you weren't with our office, you should speak with your attorney and review your current documents and see if this change in circumstance requires any changes to your documents. As I said, very often in our documents, we do a trigger trust, which would say, if this person is in need of it, then put the assets into a supplemental needs trust, but that might not be enough. And in some cases, again, if there's already a trust existing, you might want your will to say, anything that I leave to my son, I wanna to leave to him in this other trust that has been created and direct the assets into that trust. Okay. Any other questions, feel free to write in. I'll just wait a few minutes if people are still writing. All right, we might have hit everyone. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And again, if you have any uh, questions, feel free to reach out and, oh, well, uh, there we go. We had waited a little longer. Let's see. Okay. What about a person that left an inheritance to a disabled party and the will is deceased? Probate was done already. So I think this question is asking, so someone died the will was probated, assets were left to an individual, there was no trust created, but that individual is uh, now is going to receive those assets, what do you do? Um, I'll answer that question. And if that's not the question, then feel free to write in a clarification. Um, in that case, that's where that first party trust comes in. So if probate was done and the money came to the disabled individual, um, depending on certain factors, we would probably just say that that individual should create a first party supplemental needs trust if they are disabled, and then the assets can be put into the trust for their benefit. They can either create it on their own, or they might need a, an agent under a power of attorney, 
or a court, a guardianship in order to create that trust if they don't have the capacity to do it on their own. And then again, that first party trust, because they put their own money in it, because the inheritance comes to them and then goes into the trust, will have a payback to the Medicaid program at the death of the disabled beneficiary. I hope that answered the question. I will wait another minute and just to see if anyone else has any follow-up questions to what was discussed. All right, well, thank you so much everyone for joining us and I hope you have a wonderful day. Oh, we got one more, here we go. <laughs> uh, So there, there is a special needs trust that was all, that was created. Um, and are there any changes that would be necessary? Um, you know, it all depends on exactly what the document says and what changes uh, in the law may have happened in the meantime or changes in circumstance. But I think this goes to the question that I would say that your estate plan should be reviewed every three to five years. Um, and certainly if you notice a large change in the law, that might trigger another reason to review your estate plan. But if you haven't been in a while, I would recommend coming in and updating everything or not updating necessarily, but certainly checking in on the plan to see if your change in assets or circumstances, or uh, like I said, the SECURE Act, which has come into play since uh, January 1 of 2020, may affect how your plan should read and may, may require changes as a result. All right, thanks everybody. Have a great day.